Welcome to our The World Brief program. Today, we remember the incredible life of Edna O'Brien, the Irish literary trailblazer whose groundbreaking works challenged societal norms, as she passes away at the age of 93. Her debut novel, The Country Girls, was a defining moment in literature and paved the way for many more stories that defied conservative expectations. Her legacy will undoubtedly live on through her extensive body of work. Switching gears to the world of sports, Megan Gustafson, a standout player in the WNBA and former college basketball star, has made a surprising Olympic debut with Spain's national team. Gustafson's impressive performance, scoring 29 points in an overtime victory against China, has set the stage for what could be a thrilling journey to Olympic gold. Despite the language barrier, she has found a new home with her Spanish teammates and is eager to bring glory to her adopted team. In a significant legal development, a Libyan court has handed down prison sentences to 12 officials for their roles in the catastrophic dam collapses last year that led to the deaths of thousands. The court found these individuals guilty of mismanagement and negligence, highlighting the severe consequences of their actions. The verdict serves as a stark reminder of the importance of accountability in the face of disaster. Please stay tuned for more detailed coverage of these stories. The Associated Press, Edna O'Brien, the illustrious Irish author renowned for her groundbreaking debut novel, The Country Girls, has passed away at the age of 93. O'Brien's literary journey began with a scandalous bang, as her first novel, written in just three weeks and published in 1960, was both celebrated and condemned. It followed the lives of two young women navigating their way from a rural convent to the bustling city of Dublin, challenging Ireland's conservative norms. Despite the backlash, including public book burnings and criticism from her own family, O'Brien's fearless exploration of taboo subjects like loneliness, rebellion, and desire cemented her status as a literary iconoclast. Over her prolific career, she wrote more than 20 books and became a global literary figure, mingling with stars and statesmen alike. Her works, often autobiographical, delved deep into themes of love, loss, and the human condition, making her a voice for Irish women and a beacon of artistic courage. Associated Press, Megan Gustafson, a celebrated basketball player from Wisconsin, has added another feather to her cap by making her Olympic debut with Spain's national team. Gustafson, who has played for various WNBA teams and is currently with the Las Vegas Aces, scored a team-high 29 points in a thrilling overtime victory against China. Spain, which ranks fourth globally in women's basketball, naturalized Gustafson after recognizing her talent in Europe. This move has given Gustafson a new lease on her career, providing her with the stability and recognition she lacked in the WNBA. Despite the language barrier, with all play calls in Spanish, Gustafson has seamlessly integrated into the team, thanks to her teammates' support and a hired language teacher. Her family, donning Spain's colors, cheered her on from the stands, as she expressed her gratitude for the opportunity and her ambition to challenge the dominant U.S. team for the gold medal. Associated Press in a significant legal development, a Libyan court has sentenced 12 current and former officials to prison terms ranging from 9 to 27 years for their roles in the catastrophic dam failures that devastated the city of Derna last year. The dams, overwhelmed by Storm Daniel, unleashed a torrent of water that destroyed large parts of the city and resulted in thousands of deaths. The court found the officials guilty of mismanagement, negligence, and errors that contributed to the disaster, which saw entire neighborhoods washed away. Despite warnings and allocated funds for maintenance, the dams had not been properly cared for since their construction in the 1970s. The verdict, which includes orders for some officials to return illicitly gained money, can be appealed. This trial underscores the ongoing turmoil in Libya, a country divided by rival administrations and plagued by years of conflict since the ousting of dictator Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. Associated Press in the enchanting gardens of Versailles, Olympic equestrian riders experienced a truly memorable gallop amidst the grandeur of the historic palace grounds. The vibrant scene saw 40,000 fans basking under a bright sun, cheering as riders and their horses navigated the cross-country section of the eventing competition. U.S. rider Boyd Martin, aboard Fadarman B, expressed his awe at competing in such a historic location, imagining the kings and queens who once roamed these paths. French rider Stéphane Landois, riding Chemin de Monceau, praised the supportive atmosphere created by the crowd. The course, designed by Pierre Le Goupil, featured unique challenges like pontoon bridges and water obstacles shaped like royal symbols, adding to the unforgettable experience. Spectators like Alison Sandifer and Mary Blunt lauded the course's design and the overall Olympic ambience. As the event continued, the anticipation for the final showjumping section grew, promising more thrilling moments in the picturesque setting of Versailles. 
South China Morning Post, Hong Kong's Vivian Kong Manwai etched her name in history with a stunning gold medal win in the women's Apei fencing at the Paris Olympics, embodying the Hong Kong spirit of determination and resilience. Kong's victory, achieved in a dramatic 13-12 sudden death comeback, marked only the third Olympic gold for the city and ensured a consecutive medal win for Hong Kong in successive summer games. Her triumph resonated deeply, with Chief Executive John Lee Kachiu and Sports Minister Kevin Young Yun Hung expressing immense pride and gratitude. Kong's achievement also sparked celebrations in Hong Kong, with businesses anticipating a boost in sales and footfall. The win was celebrated not just locally but also on Chinese social media, where her calm demeanor and perseverance were widely praised. Kong's story, from her academic achievements to her Olympic glory, became a symbol of inspiration, highlighting the broader impact of her victory on the city's morale and economy. Associated Press, Stefan Jaeger's journey from Germany to the Paris Olympics is a tale of unexpected paths and remarkable achievements. Known for letting his golf scores speak for themselves, Jaeger's story gained attention when he set a Corn Ferry Tour record with a 58 at the Ellie May Classic in 2016. His path to the Olympics began when his parents sent him to the Baylor School in Tennessee, a decision that initially puzzled him. Despite the cultural shock and challenges, Jaeger's talent shone through, leading to a successful college career and a professional breakthrough with a win against Scotty Scheffler at the Houston Open. Now representing Germany at the Olympics, Jaeger reflects on his journey with pride, maintaining his German heritage while embracing his American experiences. His participation in the Games is a testament to his perseverance and adaptability, highlighting the unique blend of influences that have shaped his career and life. Nikkei Asia, during her inaugural visit to Beijing as Italy's Prime Minister, Georgia Maloney committed to revitalizing cooperation with China, signing a three-year action plan aimed at exploring new forms of industrial collaboration. This visit marks a significant shift in Italy's approach following its exit from China's Belt and Road Initiative last year under U.S. pressure. Maloney emphasized the strategic importance of sectors like electric mobility and renewables in the new memorandum. The trip included meetings with key Chinese officials and participation in an Italy-China business forum attended by major Italian companies such as Pirelli and ENI. Maloney's efforts to attract Chinese investment align with her broader strategy to stimulate Italy's sluggish economic growth. Despite Italy's withdrawal from the Belt and Road Initiative, trade with China remains substantial, with China being Italy's largest non-EU trading partner. The visit also highlighted Italy's support for EU tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, a move that has provoked retaliatory measures from Beijing. Be Associated Press, at the Paris Olympics, Brazilian skateboarding prodigy Raisa Lille overcame a rocky start to secure a spot in the finals of the women's street skateboarding event. Initially struggling and on the verge of tears after falling in her first two runs, the 16-year-old rallied, landing impressive tricks that catapulted her into seventh place among the finalists. Lille, who became the youngest Brazilian Olympic medalist at age 13 in Tokyo, wowed the crowd with a kickflip backside lipside scoring 92.68. The event, held at La Concorde Urban Park, saw top performances from other young talents, including Japan's Koko Yoshizawa and Liz Akuma. Despite the challenges, Lille's resilience and skill earned her a place in the finals, where she aims to compete more relaxed and focused. The competition also featured standout performances from skaters like Funa Nakayama and Chloe Covell, showcasing the global talent in women's skateboarding. South China Morning Post, amid escalating tensions with the United States, China has called on Southeast Asian nations to resist external interference, particularly from the US and NATO, in regional matters. During an ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in Laos, top Chinese diplomat Wang Yi emphasized that the US has no right to intervene in the South China Sea, a region fraught with maritime disputes involving China and several ASEAN members. The meeting underscored the deep divisions within ASEAN over how to handle China's assertive behavior. Wang criticized the US-led Indo-Pacific strategy, arguing it exacerbates security dilemmas and disrupts regional peace. In response, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken condemned China's actions in the South China Sea. The gathering highlighted the growing polarization in global politics, with ASEAN caught between the US-China rivalry. Indonesian Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi and South Korean Foreign Minister Cho tae echoed concerns about great power dominance and the importance of a rules-based order, respectively, reflecting the complex dynamics at play in the region. <music> Associated Press, Canada is embroiled in a scandal involving allegations of drones spying on opponents' training sessions, which has led to significant repercussions for their national soccer teams. 
The scandal first came to light at the 2022 CONCACAF W Championship, where the Canadian women's team was accused of filming an opponent's practice. This controversy has resulted in FIFA banning coach Bev Priestman for a year and fining Canada Soccer $226,000, along with a six-point deduction in the Olympics women's soccer tournament. The incident has raised concerns about systemic ethical shortcomings within Canadian soccer, with further allegations involving the men's national team at the recent Copa America. Canadian officials, including Canada Soccer CEO Kevin Blue, are investigating the matter, while the team faces the challenge of advancing in the Olympics despite the sanctions. The South China Morning Post, at the Paris Olympics, Australian swimmers are making a strong statement in the 200 meters freestyle, posing a significant challenge to Hong Kong's Siobhan Hahi. Hahi, who qualified fifth fastest for the semi-finals, expressed confidence in her performance, aiming to conserve energy for the final. Australian swimmers Molly O'Callaghan and Ariane Titmus have delivered impressive times, with Titmus, the reigning Olympic champion, signaling her intent to defend her title despite feeling sluggish after her recent 400-meter freestyle gold. The competition is fierce, with other strong contenders like China's Li Bingjia and Canada's Sophie Mary Harvey also in the mix. Hahi, who carried Hong Kong's flag at the opening ceremony, remains focused on bringing pride to her city as she prepares for the high-stakes final. Yahoo US, Italy and China have signed a three-year economic cooperation pact, as announced by Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni during her state visit to Beijing. While the exact details of the agreement remain undisclosed, Meloni emphasized the need for fairer trade relations, highlighting the significant trade deficit Italy faces with China, which exceeded €40 billion Euro last year. She pointed out the disparity in investment levels between the two countries and expressed a desire to narrow this gap. The visit comes amid tensions following Italy's decision to withdraw from China's Belt and Road Initiative, a major infrastructure project aimed at enhancing economic ties. Meloni is scheduled to meet Chinese leader Xi Jinping to discuss the future of bilateral relations and explore new avenues for cooperation. New York Times The Olympic Games have long been governed by a tacit code, if fans can't say anything nice, they shouldn't say anything at all. Jeering, whistling, and catcalling at athletes who have spent years to make it to the pinnacle of their sports is unacceptable, as Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee, once put it. Taboo is, well, taboo. As far as the French are concerned, though, there appears to be one exception, anyone wearing the sky blue and white of Argentina. In the opening few days of the Paris Games, Argentina was booed before, during, and after a men's soccer game in Marseille. It was heartily booed for three days straight every time its men's rugby sevens team appeared at a packed Stade de France. And it was booed again whenever one of those rugby players had the temerity to touch the ball. The hostility has left some of the country's opponents wondering what is going on. Nicholas Malof, an Australian rugby sevens player, said he did not know the background behind the tension. Antonin Boya, representing Kenya in the same sport, assumed the local French crowd was just backing an underdog. In reality, the animosity is much more targeted. Both sides have come to understand that France, at this moment in time, does not much like Argentina. It has become a real rivalry for us, said Jules Bryand, a French fan who traveled both to watch his team compete in rugby sevens and to indulge in a little jeering. Al Jazeera. Russian President Vladimir Putin has warned the United States against deploying long-range missiles in Germany, saying Russia, in that case, would restart production of intermediate-range nuclear weapons and station similar missiles within striking distance of the West. The US on July 10 said it would start deploying long-range missiles in Germany from 2026 as part of a longer-term militarization that will include SM-6, Tomahawk cruise missiles, and developmental hypersonic weapons. In a speech to sailors from Russia, China, Algeria, and India to mark the Russian Navy Day in the former imperial capital of St. Petersburg, Putin on Sunday said the U.S. risked triggering a Cold War-style missile crisis with the move. The flight time to targets on our territory of such missiles, which in the future may be equipped with nuclear warheads, will be about 10 minutes, Putin said. We will take mirror measures to deploy, taking into account the actions of the United States, its satellites in Europe, and in other regions of the world. Such missiles, which can travel between 500 and 5,500 kilometers, 310 to 3,420 miles, were the subject of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, INF, treaty signed by the US and the Soviet Union in 1987. But both Washington and Moscow withdrew from the Arms Control Treaty in 2019, each accusing the other of violations. Putin, who sent his army into Ukraine in 2022, cast the war as part of a historic struggle with the West, 
which he says humiliated Russia after the Soviet Union fell in 1991 by encroaching on what he considers Moscow's sphere of influence. Ukraine and the West say Putin is engaged in an imperial-style land grab. They have pledged to defeat Russia, which currently controls about 18% of Ukraine, including Crimea, and parts of four regions in eastern Ukraine. Russia says the lands, once part of the Russian Empire, are now again part of Russia and that they will never be given back. Russian and U.S. diplomats say relations are worse than even during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. While both the powers urge de-escalation, they are also accused of taking steps towards escalation. Putin said the U.S. had transferred Typhon missile systems to Denmark and the Philippines, and compared the U.S. plans to the NATO decision to deploy Pershing II launchers in Western Europe in 1979. The Soviet leadership, including General Secretary Yuri Andropov, feared Pershing II deployments were part of an elaborate U.S.-led plan to decapitate the Soviet Union by taking out its political and military leadership. This situation is reminiscent of the events of the Cold War related to the deployment of American medium-range Pershing missiles in Europe, Putin said. New York Times. The top diplomatic and defense officials from the United States and Japan announced on Sunday that their nations would take concrete steps to bolster their military alliance because of the growing threat from China in the region. Those steps include establishing a joint force headquarters that would answer to the American commander in the Indo-Pacific, according to a statement issued by the two government's top officials and the committee that they oversaw. They also call for increasing co-production of air-to-air -air missiles and air defense interceptor missiles. The statement framed these changes in the alliance relationship mainly as a response to aggressive moves by China in East Asia. The statement focused on China's actions in the East China Sea, South China Sea, and beyond while also mentioning hostile activity by Russia and North Korea. The governments reaffirmed the importance of the mutual defense clause in their treaty because of the increasingly severe security environment caused by recent moves of regional actors, they said. One of the top issues cited was the East China Sea, which Japan and China both claim part of. The American and Japanese senior officials said their governments reiterated their strong opposition to China's intensifying attempts to unilaterally change the status quo by force or coercion. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony J. Blinken, and the U.S. Defense Secretary, Lloyd J. Austin III, were in Tokyo on Sunday to meet with their Japanese counterparts in what is commonly called a 2 plus 2 dialogue. Thank you for tuning in. The content above showcases the latest briefing reports and analytical synopses, thoughtfully curated by the 6Do team. These insights stem from a wide array of reputable media outlets, think tanks, government sources, and specialized experts worldwide. We encourage you to explore these sources for a comprehensive perspective. Keep in mind that while the content may not always align with the official standpoint of 6Do brief, it's not meant to be taken as absolute directives for decision-making. Comprising seasoned media professionals, learned scholars, and accomplished scientists, the 6Do team embodies a trailblazing, fully independent media entity. To customize 6Do Brief to meet your professional needs, you have the option to subscribe to a diverse array of briefings on our website, 6dobrief.com. Regardless of your location, you can conveniently receive 6Do Brief via email. Rise and fall, traitors bleed, now our cause. Factories roar, steel and fight, workers sweat, endless night, stop on its search, shadows bled, rise of empires golden. Dragons roll, blood and steel, screams unheard, love is real, in war crews cold, for shoes made. Curse you all, silent fight, cradles burn, black at night, too strong, the ugly, economic power, move a steam, contract sign, trails deep, backroom deals, drops of sleep, night bombs echo, breach insatiable cry. In this metal wasteland, dreams die.
Dreams die. 